Uh, today I'm speaking with uh, Tony Curtis, uh, a poet from Dublin. He is the winner of the Lawrence O'Shaughnessy uh, Poetry Award for 2018, 22nd winner, which is awarded by the Center for Irish Studies here at the University of St. Thomas in St. Paul. Uh, welcome, Tony. Oh, um, it's nice to be here. Can you, can you tell us just a little bit about your background and how you got into uh, uh, poetry? Poetry? Be, yeah. Well, I suppose it has a Minnesota connection because yeah. when we were young, uh, before Facebook and all the world of uh, screens, we, we were all into Bob Dylan. Right. We were all into Joni Mitchell, Leonard Cohen. And, uh, but Bob would, would have been the main man. Uh, I'm here in Mississippi the last few days, or Minnesota, walking the banks of the Mississippi looking for Bob Dylan. So we would have gone in and we would have sang Girl from the North Country. Yeah. Which, if you look at it, it's a, it, it has full chiming rhymes. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think la later on when we went to college, uh, we, all, we, all, we all joined po poetry societies. But we mm. all, see, I learned guitar. If you ask me why I learned guitar and sang Bob Dylan, I'd say it probably was to get a girlfriend. Mm -hmm. I noticed that if you were in a band, it helped. If you were a small little fella. Yeah. Uh, and then when we went to the poetry society, we mm. all the, in, in, went to university and all the queues were there. Uh, uh, the, the, the sports queues were all very long, but the, the poetry queue was uh, all women. <laughs> and, uh, so we said, we'll go, we'll go, we'll go with that <laughs> queue. Uh, but I always liked poetry. I always liked words. Uh, I always liked putting words together. Um, even I, was, I wasn't much good at school when I was young. Right, right. I wasn't much good at school until I went to university, mm -hmm. which is kind of an odd statement. But yeah, yeah. But school, I was trying out of three, three schools I was trying out of. Mm -hmm. uh, but when I got to college, I probably could have lived at college for the rest of my life because mm -hmm. nobody asked you to do anything. Yeah, yeah. If you wanted to do anything, you had to do it yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, so I, I, I liked reading, I li and I liked putting poems together. And I find writing poetry that if if somebody has to force you to do it, yeah, yeah. then you're not going to do it. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. So it's. What it's was the Dublin uh, like? The Dublin poetry scene like when you were growing up? Um, well, I, I was in England. You were in England. I okay, was in yeah, England. Yeah, yeah. I, no, I grew up in Dublin. I grew up in Dublin, and it was yes. all, it, as I said, music, but. Uh, See, been, been thrown out of so many schools, uh, uh, I had to go to England and uh, yeah. work over there for two years. Night classes, I did lots of night classes. Yeah, and yeah. I worked with some uh, very interesting people. Blake Morrison, who became the editor yeah. of uh, the literary editor of The Observer, yeah, I yeah. think probably the TLS. He had, a, he had a, a poetry workshop that he ran in New Cross. Yeah, yeah. And we, used to, we had a small poetry group, mm -hmm. and there was people like uh, Wendy Cope, Alan Jenkins, yeah, yeah. Fred De Geer, lots of uh, very interesting writers in that little group. Yeah, yeah. And uh, he, got, he got me as well to interested in poetry. And then from there I went to university. And then after university, and while at university, I, I published my first collection. Yeah, yeah. And then I just kept rolling. And I've never had a job. Yeah, yeah. Glad uh, you're lucky. <laughs> Well, I, I, I tried it once, but I didn't like it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It didn't suit me. So I, 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 so I like the poetry. I like reading poetry. I like, I like going to schools. But yeah, I wouldn't yeah. like to teach. I wouldn't like to go to school every day. I yeah, like yeah. Uh, I love uh, the audience of children. I think mm -hmm. they're a fantastic audience. I love their brutal honesty. Yeah, yeah. Sure, your poem is brutal. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I love playing with their minds. And I think yeah. because I do, I do an awful lot of schools. And because I do so many schools, I think that's added something to, uh, to my writing. Mm -hmm. a, a, a very simple quality. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I come from a long line of Cistercians. Right, right. My, uh, my father's three brothers were Cistercian monks, mm -hmm. men who didn't talk very much. Mm -hmm. And my mother said, now Tony's going around speaking enough for the three of them. <laughs> but, uh, so I think I write simple poetry. Do you want to read uh, the, in the collection, The Well and the Rain? Mm -hmm. I think the first one, the first poem, I think, gives us some yep. home thoughts, gives us some home sense thoughts, of, yes. yeah, of, of kind of where you came from yep. a little bit, you know? I like um, that. We were told, uh, I remember writing this poem that we went to, a, we were given a class in how to write poetry. Yeah, yeah. And uh, the best line that day was um, from T.S. Eliot, poor poets imitate, uh, good poets st steal. And uh, so I stole from a uh, poem, this, this, this is one of the first poems I ever wrote. And I, st I stole the, from the start to the finish. But, uh, and it's just my life story. Will I fire away? Yeah, fire away. 
home thoughts. I was born in Dublin between the Docklands and the Hill of Hoth. A Catholic's youth said prayers beside the quiet altar of my little bed. A Catholic's education, the soft swish of leather against the dark robes, the clock ticking slowly through classes in Irish and English. I learned the poetry of fear, lived for the holy days. Easter, wit, a glorious Saint Patrick, awaited the death of De Valera. Through those school days, the taste of freedom was always on my mind. I remember the joy of being called early from class to sing soprano in the school choir, bored. I stood at the bottom of a small squad of boys, gazing out as the clouds pushed past towards Wexford, Galway, Donegal, or perhaps like the mail boat I took toward Hollyhead, land of dead kings and old queens, land of Shakespeare who saw through both and reached into our soul, land of mad Cromwell, blind Milton, land of that epic idiot Spencer. Did you know there's a Curtis in the taming of the shrew, an aged servant who dreams of better times and spends his days opening doors for others. So many of the Irish in London, myself included, unrehearsed, could have played his role so well. Seven years I spent in England. I didn't then, nor do I now, understand why I left these shores. But when I stand on a bog on such an unholy day as this, knowing that every wet shadow I meet along the road is heading for shelter, it's only natural to think that in my day, Dublin was much like this, a wilderness for childhood. In my youth, the world and its streets were cold. That's my story. Yeah, that's very, very powerful. I like in this collection you have, um, uh, a little bit further in the collection, this far north, you have the, this poem by another great um, uh, Dublin writer, uh, Samuel Beckett. Oh, yeah. uh, the poem Island Man in Paris on page 52. Um, and I think yeah. that's uh, one of the things that I really like about your poetry is that you really acknowledge um, sort of the, the tribe of poets, this, 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 oh, this yes. kind of world it, yeah. tribe, you know, that you see yourself. Well, Michael Hartner always yeah. saw it as a calling. Yeah, that you calling. are part, uh, part of a tribe. Yeah, yeah. And I'd say that most of the poets in Ireland know each other. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. Know, are, are definitely aware of each other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of them know each other. Uh, Samuel Beckett. I always loved Beckett. From yeah. the first time yeah, yeah. I, uh, I, I, I saw uh, his work, loved him, and, and still do. Probably my favourite writer, uh, in, in uh, Irish writer. Yeah, yeah. I have several. Like I love the poetry of Elizabeth Bishop here in this part of the world, but uh, well Beckett so was always... So is your favourite play uh, Crap's Last Tape? Or is well, it I, have I love Crap's Last Tape. I was Best asked by uh, Archie one time for yeah. some shows we were doing, yeah. what... Uh, what poem got you going? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What poem set you on fire? And various poets ch chose various poems. And I cho chose Crap's Last Tape. Yeah, yeah. And they said to me, well, it's not a poem, Tony. And I said, have you read it? It's so beautiful. Because yeah. Beckett had been writing yeah. in French for about 11 years. Yeah, yeah. And suddenly his, his, his friend died. And he came back to France. He came over to Ireland. And then back to uh, France. I went to his little house in Ussi, and he wrote uh, this play mm -hmm. quite quickly over, over Christmas. Mm -hmm. And having not written in English for about 11 years, the language in Crap's Last Tape is yeah. so rich. It's richer yeah. than and softer than anything Beckett did be, uh, before. Yeah. Uh, and I, loved, I love Beckett's lines. I like, I like his humour. Yeah, his humour is I, great. I fell all, when I saw Crap's Last Tape, I fell around the place laughing. Yeah, yeah. You know, everybody else in the theatre was sitting up straight and paying attention. Yeah, yeah. I just thought it was so funny. I like his lines. Like when uh, his publisher, John Calder, out for a walk one day, the two in the mountain, the glorious sunshine, yeah. and Calder says to Beckett, great day to be alive, Sam. And he said, I wouldn't go that far, <laughs> which I read. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You, know. you want to read, perhaps, Island of Man in Paris? Yeah, Island of Man in Paris. Now, these are poems I haven't read for a very long time, but yeah. it's nice. Island of Man in Paris, in memory of Samuel Beckett. When I saw him last, he was all dejection, hands deep in the pockets of an old duffel. He had a boatman's love of big hoods. Living so far inland, he lacked the view of the sea, though everything about him said island man. Hair bleached white by the years at sea, face chiseled by the salt in the wind. Then those perfect blue eyes, set deep 
to see through mist and spray. What hope had eyes like these staring down narrow streets, everything crowding into them without perspective. When I saw him last, he was standing amongst dustbins. I'm old, he said. I'm all used up. I'm waiting to be collected. But Sam, there's no ships on the Rue Saint-Jacques. That's not strange, he said. Haven't you noticed? There's no water, only God's rain and our tears. Yeah, very good. Mm. Why, why do you see Beckett as an island man? I like, really like that. You're connecting with the Blaskets and the, that well, kind Well, I of think there's something about, if you ever look at his yeah, face, face, he yeah, has yeah. that, you know, the John Minahan photographs. Yeah, yeah, the Minahan photographs, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. John Minahan, uh, and Minahan talk, when Minahan uh, uh, talks about uh, photographing Beckett, he says that uh, Beckett would, would, would set the scene, would, would have it all set up ready. Uh, he'd want to, he'd know exactly, with that great uh, theatrical, that great, yeah, uh, yeah. You know, just seeing it, the, be the very famous photograph of, Beck uh, of Beckett in that cafe in Paris mm -hmm. uh, with, the, with the, the coffee cup here, yeah. the cigarette there. And the, uh, John said just, just that, that evening when, he, when Beckett rang him up and said, meet me in this cafe, uh, he said he, uh, it was almost as if he had it all planned that at about five or six o'clock in the evening when all the lights went on in the cafe. Yeah. Uh, and he's all, the, all set up and he says to take me now. So he was very aware of his uh, image. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, it, that, but I always think of him as, as a fisherman, uh, in the same way as I think of my friend Michael Hartnett as a, as a bird. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just some people are what they are, what you... Before we talk about Michael yeah. Hartnett, do you have a poem about, seeing as you're in Minnesota, and another Minnesota connection yeah. to Ireland besides uh, the great Bob Dylan is Tyrone Guthrie, and Tyrone Guthrie's um, home oh, yeah. in F County Monaghan, Anna yeah. McCary. Um, and you have a poem about staying do, at the big I house. I do, I um, Oh yeah, see what I have, the note I have there from Colm Tobin. <laughs> do you want me to read the note? Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, Bernard Lachlan ran the Tyrone Guthrie Centre in, uh, I used to call it Banana McCarrick, yeah, up yeah. the road from uh, New Bliss. <laughs> we used to say, if this is New Bliss, what was Old Bliss like? Yeah, yeah. And uh, Bernard was very touchy <laughs> about the car park. It, 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 in front of the house, yeah, right? yeah. So, because the big picture window, you could look down over the lake uh, in Guthrie's house, and uh, one, one one day, Colm Tobin came down, and this note was on his windscreen from Bernard. Uh, Colm, move your damn jar from in front of the house. The poets must be able to see the lake at all times, Bernard. <laughs> 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 but I found I, I never slept. Uh, well, like we used to go to the house and do uh, tr translations from S Spanish, Greek, yeah, yeah, all this Portuguese. Uh, I, I couldn't go somewhere to write poetry. I'm like Pat, when Patrick Cavan says, if you can't find it in, if you can't find it inside yourself, yeah, like yeah. you won't find it on an island. Yeah, yeah. But you see, the, the title of this collection here, the, the selected poems, is "The Well in the Rain," mm -hmm. and I, I, I believe that. Uh, writing po poetry is a bit like uh, Seamus Heaney said. It's like dropping a bucket into yourself yeah, yeah. and, and uh, pulling it up and seeing what, what comes yeah, up. Yeah, yeah. And I call that book The Well in the Rain because uh, a lot of the poems at the end of the book about my father's death. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I've so I call it The Well in the Rain. I'd rather have my father than have the poems, but yeah, that's yeah, the way yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. this is the poem. Anyway, so we go back to the Tyrone Guthrie Centre. I just spent the afternoon in the Tyrone Guthrie Theatre, theater. just down by the Mississippi, and yeah. that's some theatre. It's an extraordinary, it's an extraordinary yeah. place. Yeah, 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 wonderful. Okay, here, staying at the big house, poets, painters, playwrights haunt this house. It is an eerie place to linger after dark. My room looks out over a shadowy lake, a cauldron of dreams for the banshee, a dark well for the women of the wood. At dusk, I shutter my window against their spell. Turn my chair toward the fire and wait for spirits to emerge from the walls, to haunt the rooms with wails like the wind. Last night, I met the ghost of a girl upon the stairs. She had pale blue eyes, sorry. She had pale blue eyes and pale blue hair. As she swept through me, my bones were dipped in ice, as if she had stolen a kiss from my soul, and my soul had died for a moment to steal it back. Can you just talk a little bit about what Anna McCarrig is like, the being there as a 
Well, Bernard's is gone. Bernard's so gone, yeah. Bernard's, yeah. Bernard's gone. And I uh, haven't been there for years. Right. But for me, it was uh, full of ghosts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The place was terribly haunted. Uh, but, but, but we always, lo I loved the, 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 uh, the friendship and the, we, I'd go there with Theo Dorgan, Paul and Meehan, yeah, Pat yeah. Bourne. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, we'd, we'd, have, we'd have a good time. But everybody would eat dinner around the everybody table. Everybody would eat dinner around yeah. the table and there'd be all, all yeah, yeah. sorts. Um, that was in his will, that was in Guthrie's will. Will, that yes. All the artists staying in, the, in his you house had, had, had to sit together. You had to come down for dinner. Yeah, you had you couldn't to. Be, you couldn't be uh, up yeah. in your room uh, yeah, yeah. finishing another stanza. Yeah, yeah. What's the poet from Sligo who used to come down there, uh, the Daedalus poet? She, uh, no matter, she, she used to come down and uh, she didn't like the ghosts, but she always asked for the John Jordan room because oh. the, because the the ghost of Don John Jordan stood in the door and kept all the other ghosts out, and she slept like a baby then. <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, that's terrible. Emmett Healy's friend. Uh, well, perhaps we can move on to mm. a poem with, I think, uh, some of your aesthetic uh, philosophy. Anyway, it strikes me, the poem, the great poem, What Darkness Covers, Covers page, yes. page 118. 118. This yeah. was the start of a book I did on uh, Lucy and Freud. You know, all my books have a, kind of a theme. Uh, right, right. Uh, so, 118. Uh, I remember the first time I read this poem. I read it in the Central Mental Hospital. Okay, yeah. And uh, uh, we, uh, I said the title, I said, here's a new poem. Um, it's called What Darkness Covers. And the voice at the back of the room said, quite a bit, quite a bit. <laughs> uh, but what was funny about this poem is, uh, I, I, I go off and do my poetry stuff. Um, yeah, yeah. Next week I'm going to... Washington State. I spent January in uh, Australia at a Fenian Freedom Festival. Mm -hmm. But so I'm I'm used to going away. But when my wife goes away in the winter to visit her sister in Australia, I rattle around the house like uh, you know like a lonely old soul. And, and that's where the poem came from. But uh, this was the last poem I, I ever read to Michael Hartnett. Oh, okay. So it, uh, it has become a, a kind of a... Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about Michael yeah, Harden yeah. in just a moment. Yeah, yeah. What darkness covers. Because I cannot sleep and you are far away, this disheveled bed holds no dreams and blankets and darkness cover only emptiness. I look where you should be, but you are utterly again. I lie remembering. My grandmother used to say, the dead love this time of year, the night so long, they walk amongst us whispering. This morning I found footprints on the path, tears on every leaf. Listen, is that a door opening or a door closing? Old Italians used to say, the most beautiful sculptor Michelangelo ever made was a snowman in the Babalai Gardens. A male, nude, chiseled out of ice. You could see where his soul was held. He turned all to tears and was washed away. I do this all the time, try to hold on. Sometimes I feel I am the last leaf on the tree and there will be no rest until I fall. And so I say, let everything that falls fall, beginning with tired love and ending in the old way. The eyes still, the breath gone, all quiet until the earth's rain so this brings us to Michael Hartnett. So yeah. the the collection um, folk, I believe, has the folk. Yeah, so folk. When I got to the end of that poem, reading that poem to Michael Hartnett, yeah, yeah, yeah. Dundrum, yeah, Michael yeah. says to me, "Jesus Curtis, that's terrible, sad. Come on, let's go to crazy prices." <laughs> <laughs> so talk about Michael Hartnett. So yeah. he was he was one of the very uh, significant. He was a, like he was. A, Wonderful, wonderful man, wonderful poet. Yeah, yeah. More lyric gift in his little finger than um, yeah, yeah, most yeah. of us, the rest of the poets put together. But he had that George Best streak. Yeah, yeah. It was as if God, when he was coming out of heaven, when he was being born, God sprinkled him with dust to make, give him this yeah, yeah. huge talent. And then just at the last second, he decided, I'll give him 99% talent and then a, a huge thirst. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The thirst, the yeah, thirst, yeah, 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 yeah. And, uh, yeah. and uh, he died on the 13th of October, 1999. Yeah, yeah. We all went down and uh, and then a few, a few, a few years later, I was teaching at the 
school in Renale, I think it was, um, just up the road from Dartmouth Road where he lived. Mm -hmm. So at lunchtime, I went down to where he used to live and I stood by the railings. And with the, uh, the boom at the time going, you know, uh, the, the house, his apartment had changed beyond recognition. Right Somebody right. had bought it and turned it from a poet's house into a, a banker, a businessman, a developer's house. Yeah, and it yeah. was so almost, I nearly stood at the railings crying. Yeah, yeah. Michael, people used to keep complaining about his garden. So sometimes he'd make a sign, uh, <laughs> he'd stick it up, wildlife reserve. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you'd have liked him. He just said. So <laughs> and what happened was I wrote, I wrote this poem standing at the railings, almost standing at the railings. And when I went back to the school to the small children, maybe they were 10-year-olds, I read them this poem. I don't know what they made of it, but the garden flash. I called to where Michael used to live on Dartmoor Road. Though I knew his shadow would be gone from the window, I thought I'd find his coffee cup, his book open on the table. But everything was gone. A life cleared up and packed away. Walls were knocked down, things papered and painted. Everything was brighter. There was a big glass window and a Chinese vase where the garage doors used to be. And out in the garden, someone had dug up the herbs he'd planted. Things were raked over, ready for the arrival of the instant lawn. Nothing was higgledy or out of place. They had even levelled the slope in the drive. You couldn't roll home anymore, just couldn't. But the dizzy miracle was, the morning I called, there'd been a light fall of snow and a set of footprints led away from the door. I just missed him. It's often much later than you think. And, uh, I won't read the poem that follows it, but the poem that follows it is what yeah. Michael used to say about his poetry and about Yeah, poems. yeah. He said, uh, like, who's the best poet or who's the best poem? All this stuff about... Uh, he wouldn't entertain that thing at all. He says, the way it works, Tony, is think of your books and your poems as being a flock of birds and you cast them into the air like this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And as the years go by, uh, some of them will hit a storm and some of them will fall this way and some of them... Yeah. And, uh, some will return. Some, so, yeah. I, so now in, in, in schools in Ireland, Michael's poem, Death of an Irish Woman, is taught. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, so that's, that's a poem, a, a bird that's still flying. Still flying, you know? yeah, 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 yeah. If we look then at, at um, your collection, approximately in the key of C. Yes, approximately in the key of C. This is so right. why, that, why that title? The title came from, I was asked to write uh, by Theo Dorgan, asked just to go to any museum in Ireland, pick an object and write about it. And I went to... The museum in Dublin, I found it was full of old stuff. And one day I was going up to, S to Sligo, I think it was, and I, I saw a sign in a hedge, the Museum of Country Life. And I, yeah. and I pulled in and I got out of the car, went into the museum, and uh, I knew I was in the right place because Theo's voice came out of the speakers. He was doing the <laughs> thing with you. And as it uh, tends to do all over Ireland. As it tends to do. And in, um, they had a classroom set up and it said, uh, classic. Uh, vintage classroom. <laughs> I said, that's not a vintage classroom, that's my classroom. Yeah. And uh, I wrote a poem about that, but it had a pony in it. Right, right. So I kept it from a book, uh, this one, yeah, yeah, Pony. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's, it's in that book. Yeah. And then um, I went deeper into the bowels of this wonderful museum, and there, almost by itself in the bottom room, was a set of illum pipes in a glass case. Right, right, right. And the illum pipes are all about air and breath. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And here it was suffocating in the thing. But some officious civil servant, some officious gentleman or person, had put a sign over these beautiful illum pipes saying, Michael Egan made these pipes in 1850, approximately in the key of C. Wow. I went up to the front desk and I said, did the man who made that sign, is he here today? And the woman said, oh no, he's off today. I said, just as well. But you can tell him that Tony Curtis uh, called in and if he had been here, you'd have kicked him in the ankle. <laughs> so. Uh, that's where that came from. Um, but it was handy that my, my initial is C for Curtis, approximately yeah, the key yeah. C. Yeah. Yeah. But the other thing was, of course, that my book before this was called uh, Folk. Folk, yes. Yeah. And my book, before, my book after Folk was called Pony. So I yeah. had Folk and Pony. So I needed a, a, a bigger title, a razzle-dazzle. Yeah. You know, razzle so I went for approximately the key yeah. C. We were going to ask me about some poem. 
Yeah, pick, uh, pick a poem from the collection that you think is... I think uh, this, bo this book was all about being uh, s uh, 60. Yeah, so yeah, all yeah. The, A lot of the poems uh, are ab about age. Um, mm -hmm. The last poem in the book is, uh, uh, I wrote it on my 60th birthday, watching the ferry go coming out back and forth out of P Port Townsend. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe I'll read that. Uh, yeah. It's called Fair Weather. Because my, my life, the way I, the way I live, I, I write a poem, yeah. and then I write another poem, and I, then I write another poem. So I go from poem to poem, like an old steamship. Or you could say I go from book to book, or from poetry reading to poetry reading. It's a strange way to live, so uh, uh, fair weather. Do poets ever reach their destination? I ask, not because I think they are like country buses, though their minds are often overcrowded, and they do tend to take the long way around. I ask because any I've ever met have been uneasy, watchful, just arrived or just about to leave, restless as a postman on his bicycle. In truth, I was thinking of ships, rusted old cargo ships, especially those you see at night out beyond the bay, their light fading, their cargo a mystery, their destination unknown, too late, alas, to wish the captain Fair weather. Last week at the end of the pier, I hailed a sailor, welcome home. I know, he said, we docked last night, we're heading out. The end of a voyage is the beginning of a voyage. I wished him fair weather. As I watched his frail craft batter the wind, I thought it's the same for poets. The end of a poem is the beginning of a poem. And so I ask again, do poets ever reach their destination. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you don't reach your, de reach your destination, yeah. you certainly have the ability to be inspired by Connemara pon ponies. Yeah, ponies. Like ponies, yeah. So um, perhaps to finish our conversation mm. today, we'll um, pick a very, very short poem. Yeah. From well, I could do the one about the classroom. Remember yeah. I was talking to you about yeah, going yeah. to the museum? Yeah, I yeah. went into the classroom, and, the, and the, uh, I'll, do, I'll do that one because it's short. School desk. Yes. Right? Uh, and you probably, I don't know, Patrick, if you remember this, these school desks, these are the ones where you, they were like, yeah, uh, I remember like, them, like yeah, a Ryan yeah. Air flight. You, yeah, you, yeah. you had to get into them and they were all wood here. Up at the new yeah. Seamus Heaney Museum, up in Derry there, they have the home place. They yeah. have Seamus's desk. And it's the same desk as my desk. Once you got in, you couldn't, you had to squiddle like this because yeah, yeah, yeah. And the, the, the brother that. could bash you, but you couldn't get out. So the school desk. It was the old school desk where I was taught to string words together by a man with a stammer, a Bible a black stick, and a Connemara pony he called Cicero. We used to call it Banjo. He liked to quote Shakespeare and read to us the poetry of John Clare and Patrick Kavanagh, the two angels at his table. A good man, he had a face like rain. Some days he was all grief, like a scarecrow. He'd shake his stick at us as if we were a flock of crows. He married a woman from Mam Cross. They had 11 boys named after the apostles. I was good friends with Tedius and Bartholomew. I still wondered if they'd had a 12th child, would they have dared to call it Judas? Yeah, on that note, um, it's been a delight today to have a conversation with um, the Dublin poet, Tony Curtis, the winner of the O'Shaughnessy Poetry Prize 2018. Thank you very much, Tony. Thank you. Pleasure, sir. I'm Patrick. Yeah.